In this episode, Matt and Tom look at the Microsoft OFAC enforcement action. Hello, everyone. Tom Fox back again with Matt Kelly for the award-winning Compliance Into the Weeds. Welcome back, Matt. Hello, Tom. Good to be here. Matt, uh, Microsoft got into a little trouble recently, and you had an occasion to write about them. What did they do that got them into trouble with OFAC? Uh, Well, yeah, this is a sanctions compliance case that uh, if sanctions compliance is on your radar, you might want to give this a close look. Uh, You are right, Tom, to describe it probably as a little bit of trouble. They paid a $3.3 million fine. Um, and given that Microsoft is one of the largest tech companies in the world, it's not a huge amount of money, but it's an interesting case. Um, I think above all else, the case is relatable in the sort of misconduct uh, that it had with end users and an overseas subsidiary. Um, There was also a lot of interesting offenses here that happened or shortcomings in its sanctions compliance program. Uh, But really, what happened is just that Microsoft has a subsidiary in Russia, had a subsidiary in Russia, that in the 2010s, the subsidiary was working with local resellers to sell software licenses to end-use customers who were in sanctioned uh, countries, up to including in Russia itself, which was under sanctions originally for its 2014 invasion of Crimea, Uh, But we had some sales there. All of this happened 2012 into 2019. Uh, Then finally, Microsoft found out about it, uh, implemented a very interesting and fulsomely described uh, remediation solution for sanctions compliance. So there's a whole lot here that compliance officers could appreciate and get your heads around. It's well worth giving the case a good look. So it was, uh, I thought, a great sort of lesson on uh, resellers and the way the uh, hardware and software industry uh, did business. But uh, you identified, uh, much to my lawyer's uh, heart, three things that went wrong. What did you see that went wrong? Yes. So here is how this happened. The actual misconduct itself was Microsoft Russia they would work with local resellers, uh, I presume in Russia and its greater economic environs. They together would then arrange these sort of bulk sales to end use customers and bulk licensing agreements. But the resellers would then sell to the individual end use customers on their own. Um, But nobody dies surprise here. Occasionally, those local resellers would sell to two sanctioned parties in Cuba, Iran, Syria, Crimea, and various Russian nationals already on the sanctions lists. Um, That information did not reach the administrative offices for Microsoft, which actually were in Ireland. So they would process all of these payments. And then finally, the end use customer would sometimes get to access Microsoft servers right here in the United States to download licenses or software. That was the, the nexus for all of this that led to sanctions violations. But we had, I thought, three big issues. First were failures of documentation. So Microsoft did not complete uh, or collect all of the information it needed for the end use customers. So we had lack of complete and accurate information on the identities of them. Um, sometimes the resellers didn't provide it. Sometimes Microsoft itself didn't follow up on the incomplete documentation. We should note that in at least a couple of instances, it seems that Microsoft Russia employees at the subsidiary level, they deliberately altered some of that information to mislead Microsoft higher-ups back in the United States and in Ireland, but we had these incomplete documentation failures. Um, There was some screening failures that also happened. Uh, And again, you know, the resellers in Russia, they didn't provide uh, information back, or they did provide the information to the administrators back in Ireland, but then the screening software in Ireland wouldn't pull together other pieces of data that the company already had about the end use customer to be able to figure out, okay, we have pieces A, B, and C of the puzzle on the end use customer. They didn't piece together D, E, and F pieces to stitch it all together to figure out, okay, this person is a sanctioned entity. We shouldn't allow the sale. Those kind of screening 
uh, needs didn't happen in the right way. Um, so you wound up with screening failures. And then we had even more screening failures, uh, actually. So for example, the screening procedures wouldn't always identify parties who weren't on sanctions lists by name, but they were submitting information in Cyrillic alphabet or Chinese characters, which would be a red flag that maybe we should try and figure this out anyways. Uh, so how the screening worked, where they were pulling the data together from, incomplete collection of data from the end use customer, so documentation, screening, more screening, IT failures or IT screening systems. Um, you know, we've heard all of this before. It's just very good specific examples that compliance officers can get their heads around. But Matt, you also found the remediation uh, in, by Microsoft intriguing and perhaps gay, giving compliance officers uh, a benchmark to move forward on. Yeah, so uh, we should note that according to OFAC and also the Bureau of Industry and Securities, which kind of tagged along with OFAC to impose this penalty. So OFAC did go through a fairly long list of um, mitigating factors that Microsoft took to lessen the severity of its sanction. But the most interesting one is that I thought Microsoft implemented a three lines of defense model, which compliance professionals have heard about many times, uh, implemented that three lines model specifically around sanctions compliance and its sanctions program. So first line, the operating business units, they would have day-to-day -day responsibility for sanctions compliance. Microsoft sales executives, they do. They have support from the trade and tax and legal functions in Microsoft, helping them build the right procedures, but still the first line, the sales executives working in these markets, they have daily responsibility. They own the risk. That's what we're supposed to do. Then in the second line, we would have Microsoft's compliance and tax and legal and some other oversight functions they would respond to any particular questions or tricky cases that the first line didn't know how to solve. They also would perform quarterly testing on the compliance, or the sanctions compliance program. Um, the second line teams then report directly to Microsoft's senior management about sanctions compliance issues. So they don't report to more senior sales and marketing executives. Senior sales and marketing executives are not in charge of sanctions compliance. They're responsible for doing it, but then the second line is peering over their shoulder, making sure sanctions compliance is working well. And then they go and they brief senior Microsoft people about how well the sanctions compliance program works. And then finally, we have the third line, Microsoft's internal audit program. They perform regular audits, including on sanctions compliance. And we should note, that appears to be how this all came to light in 2019, is that Microsoft was doing a look back review, I guess that's an audit, of its sanctions compliance program, discovered about 1,300 or so problematic transactions over the last seven or eight years in, at Microsoft. Uh, but once internal audit found that we have a sanctions issue that needs more investigation, they did all of this investigating, um, Microsoft did have voluntary self-disclosure to OFAC, so yet again, we have another plug for the importance of self-disclosure. Uh, and then all of the other usual things you would see for mitigating factors, enhanced training, better policies. Um, but I thought it was most interesting to see how Microsoft restructured its sanctions compliance program with that three lines model. Um, and Tom, the only other point that we should stress is that all of this, from 2012 to 2019, this happened before OFAC stepped up with its new guidance, I think that arrived in 2019, about how a sanctions compliance program should work. So there's certain snapshot in time element to all of this is that, you know, how did this all happen at Microsoft in the 2010s? Well, it happened because they had a, a now what we would consider to be defective sanctions compliance approach based on new guidance OFAC churned out in 2019. Matt, before we get to the OFAC guidance and say a little bit about that, there were two lines in your blog post I wanted to ask you about, uh, and they both come from the remediation section. Uh, in one, you talked about <clears throat> restricted party screening 
but that that screening happened on a persistent rather than transactional basis. And I wanted to ask you, did you see Microsoft doing ongoing screening or something else, uh, or what led to you to conclude that it was persistent rather than transactional? Well, that is how OFAC actually described it, persistent rather than transactional. So I am assuming that there is some sort of ongoing monitoring there, which is the point that OFAC talks about. That is what they would like to see. That's the ideal. Um, I realize that when you're the largest tech company in the world, you have an easier time implementing ongoing trans uh, monitoring as opposed to just one and done transactional monitoring that we mere mortals might be stuck struggling with. But that is something that you need to think about because you might do a one-time tra transactional screening and if it looks good, that's fine. But then the nature of the customer relationship changes, the nature of the customer changes, and you go through these other sorts of um, changes in risk that you're going to have to think through if you're a sanctions screening program. Uh, and ongoing monitoring is going to be ultimately the solution we all have to get to. I'm not saying it's easy, but Microsoft now apparently has done it and OFAC did give them credit for that. Matt, the second thing comes from the penultimate paragraph in your blog post, which says one major theme of that guidance is that sanctions compliance should be centralized with dedicated and competent sanctions compliance officers running the show. Does that run antithetical to anti-corruption compliance where we try to push compliance down to uh, the regional or even local business unit level? I, I don't know, ultimately. Uh, I think that would be a question for OFAC to answer. But, you know, OFAC talks about the need for a centralized compliance program with dedicated sanctions compliance experts because they point blank say sanctions is hard. This is not going to be easy stuff that you can figure out. Um, I would submit that a lot of times with anti-corruption compliance, you're trying to figure out, is this specific transaction corrupt? With sanctions compliance, it's more like, is this person corrupt? Do we know who this person is? Do we know whether this person is restructuring one deal to be able to avoid sanctions compliance detection somehow? Um, you know, they're looking to maybe process a very large money laundering payment that would set off red flags. So they split it up into five smaller payments. I get it that bribery also may happen in the same way, but, you know, it strikes me as just a categorically different type of misconduct, corruption, as opposed to sanctions. And I think OFAC recognized that. Um, I have seen other sanctions enforcement actions against I, State Street is one that comes to mind from roughly a similar time period where the reforms that they implemented were pretty much that they centralized all sanctions compliance. They had a chief sanctions compliance officer who could then handle all of these technical inquiries. And even if you think back like a few minutes ago, we were describing the three lines model. What is one role of the second line? It's to answer the really difficult questions from the first line because they're not quite sure what to do about a sanctions uh, issue that might turn up. Um, I think that's one other important point here when we talk about centralization is that you need somebody who can answer any questions from anywhere around the enterprise and also that they're not answering into a local business unit where maybe a local business president really wants the deal so they're going to turn a blind eye to sanctions issues that might be cropping up. That's also true in FCPA compliance. I get that. But um, I, I don't know that I could answer the question better than that. Now let's turn to the OFAC guidance, uh, you, which you mentioned. We actually dedicated an episode to that many moons ago. Um, but uh, once again, I have to refer to your blog post because uh, you said this guidance should be tacked to the wall of every sanctions compliance officer. Uh, maybe a few words on why you feel it was such a powerful document or how it gave us new insights into sanctions compliance, at least from OVAC. Well, I, I think that first off, it goes into some level of detail about things that such as the importance of screening technology and how you should configure your screening technology. 
We don't get that in the FCPA compliance world. We don't actually have the Justice Department specifically talking about how you would configure your due diligence third-party screening tools. OFAC does talk about that because there's a lot of name matching issues that may or may not trouble a lot of companies. And I think the other reason that OFAC's guidance is so important is because they really derived it very clearly from previous sanctions enforcement actions. I'll go back to the State Street example, which at this point now, if my memory serves, it's more than a couple of years old. I think the State Street enforcement sanction happened also in 2019, but it came out and State Street talked about how they had reformed and centralized their sanctions compliance program. And then a couple of months later, the OFAC guidance comes out and it says, one of the things you should have is a centralized sanctions compliance program. Very clearly, OVAC told State Street, this is what you should do. State Street did it. And then at some point, OVAC said, we're just going to put this in general guidance so everybody here forward will also do it. Uh, you can draw very clear connections between enforcement actions that missed what OFAC is talking about in its guidance and how that then led to this guidance in 2019 that everybody should follow going forward because, yes, OFAC will enforce it, enforce against you over this. They did it before. They'll do it again now. So, Matt, the uh, OFAC guidance, as you correctly noted, came out in May of uh, 2019. I also agree with your analysis that it gave the anti-corruption compliance professional and perhaps even the AML compliance professional uh, greater insight into screening, screening tools and the need for ongoing screening that I hope those other uh, compliance professionals have integrated into their compliance programs as well. You know, it turns out that there really is a lot to learn, uh, particularly f considering how long ago these violations occurred in a country where we can't do business anymore. So it'll be interesting to see what next week brings. It, it is fair to note, Tom, that after Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022, Microsoft has since shut down all of its Russia operations. So there isn't any more sales right now. You're right. But uh, all of this before the invasion, it's a very good, interesting example to study. This is Tom Fox. I hope you'll subscribe, rate, and review Compliance Into the Weeds, the only podcast taking a deep dive into a compliance-related topic each week. I hope you'll join Matt and I again next week where we take up another timely event. The award-winning Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.